good evening, or good afternoon, or good morning. My name is David. I'm going to be reading to you selected passages and chapters from a book in my library. The idea is to bring you subtle sounds, a state of consciousness, consciousness that is relaxed and unmoving and peaceful and tranquil. I have a book in my hands right now. And the title of the book is To the Ends of the Earth The Selected Travels of Paul Thoreau by the author of Writing the Eye on Rooster. I enjoy Paul Thoreau's books. He writes colorfully and he uses words that flow. I'll attempt to honor his writing in this video. The village of the railway station. The signs in Amstrad station. Third class excess, second class ladies waiting room and first class toilet sweepers only. Had given me a formal idea of Indian society. The less formal reality I saw at seven in the morning in the Northway Railways terminal in Old Delhi. To understand the real India, the Indians say you must go to the villages, but that is not strictly true, because the Indians have carried the villages to the railway stations. In the daytime it is not apparent. You might mistake any of these people for beggars, ticketless travellers or unlicensed hawkers. At night, and in the early morning, the station village is complete, a community so preoccupied that the thousands of passengers arriving and departing leave it undisturbed. They detour round it. The railway dealers possess the station, but only the new arrivals notice this. He feels something is wrong, but he has not learned that Indian habit of ignoring the obvious, making a detour to preserve his calm. The newcomer cannot believe he has been plunged into such intimacy so soon. In another country this would all have been hidden from him, and not even a trip to the village would reveal with this clarity of pattern of life. The village in rural India tells a visitor very little except that he is required to keep his distance and limit his experience of the place to tea or meal in a stuffy parlour. The life of the village, its interior, it's denied him. Let's move on to another one. Let's see where the pages lead me. I hope you're enjoying the sounds from the book by Paul Thoreau to the ends of the earth. looking seaward. Now I saw the British people lying around stiffly on the beach like dead insects, or huddled against the canvas windbreaks they hammered into the sand with rented mallets, or standing on cliffs and kicking stones roly-poly into the sea. And I thought, they are symbolically leaving the country. Going to the coast was as far as they could comfortably go. It was a poor person's way of going abroad, standing at the seaside and staring at the ocean. It took a little imagination. I believe that these people were fantasizing that they were there, over there, on the watery horizon at sea. Most people on the promenade walked with their faces averted from the land. Perhaps another of the coast of pleasures was being able to turn their backs on Britain. I seldom saw anyone with his back turned to the sea. It was the rarest posture on this coast. Most people looked seaward with anxious, hopeful faces, as if they had just left their native land. 
his words that he writes tend to flow so well. state of being outside somewhere far away driving to Tibet Goldmud was hardly a town it was a dozen widely scattered low buildings, some radio antennas a water tower one of the few cars in town with Mr. Few's ridiculous gallant there were some buses but they were the most punished looking vehicles I'd seen in China and no wonder, for they toiled up and down the dependent plateau. Snow, Mr. Fu said, his first word. I had not expected this snow, and it was clear from his gloomy tone that neither had he. The snow lay thinly in the town, but behind the town it was deep and dramatic, blazing in the shadows of a mountain range. He said, we cannot go to the lasso tomorrow. Maybe the day after, or the day after that, or... I asked him why. The snow. It is everywhere. It's very deep, he said. He was driving fast through the gutted Goldman streets, too fast. But I had seen him drive in Sinyin, and I knew this to be normal. As the best times, he was rather a frantic driver. The snow is blocking the road, he said. Are you sure? Yes. Did you see it? He laughed. Ha ha, you idiot. Look at it. Did anyone tell you that the road was blocked with snow? He did not reply. So that meant no. He continued the sparring. The snow was bad news. It glittered, looking as though it were there forever. But sometimes someone had a road report. Is our bus station in Goldmund? He nodded. He hated my questions. He wanted to be in charge. And how could he be if he was asking all the questions? And he had so few answers. People say the road is bad. Look at the snow. We will ask the bus station. The bus drivers will know. First, we go to the hotel, he said trying to take command. The hotel was another prison-like place with cold corridors and squawks and odd hours. He had three cactuses in my room and a calendar and two armchairs. But there were no curtains on the windows and there were no hot water. Later, they said, the lobby was wet and dirty from the mud that had been tracked in. An ornamental pond behind the hotel was filled with green eyes, and the snow was foot deep on the path to the restaurant. Let's see what else. Let's see where turning the pages will lead us. Let's read another passage together. I'm sure we can find something interesting. Are you enjoying the sounds in the voice? I hope it is not too loud for you. I'm sure I can perhaps improve this video once I have finished it and thought about what I can do to make it better. Here we go. I think we have something else for you to listen to. Another passage from his book. Holiday camp to the east, beyond the grey, puddly foreshore, the tide was out half a mile. I saw the bright flags of Pullen's mine head and vowed to make a visit. Ever since Bogner, I had wanted to snoop inside a coastal holiday camp, but I had passed the fences and gates without going in. It was not possible to make a casual visit. Holiday camps were surrounded by prison fences coils of barbed wire at the top. There were dark patrols and beware signs stenciled with skulls. The main entrances were guarded and it had turnstiles and a striped barrier that was raised to let curtains behind. 
Wetland's guest had to show passes in order to enter. The whole affair reminded me a little of Jonestown, and these elaborate security measures fueled my curiosity. What exactly was going on in here? There was no use in peering through the chain-link fence. All I could see at the end of Butlins were the boating lake and the reception area, and some snorers on deck chairs. Clearly it was a very large, very large home. Later I discovered that the camp was designed to accommodate 14,000 people. That was almost twice the population of Minehead. They had called it Butlin Land. And they said it had everything. I registered as a day visitor. I paid a fee. I was given a brochure and a booklet and your holiday program with a list of the day's events. Security staff seemed wary of me and I had just ditched my knapsack in a boarding house, but I, I was still wearing my leather jacket and oily hiking shoes. My knees were muddy, so as not to alarm the gatekeepers, I had my pocketed in my binoculars. Most of the butlins' guests wore sandals and short sleeves, and some with funny hats, holiday high spirits. The weather was overcast and cold and windy. The flags on front were as big as bedsheets and made a continental cracking. I was the only person at Butlins dressed for this foul weather. I felt like a commando. It made some people there suspicious, I assume. With its barrack-like buildings and its forbidding fences, it had the prison like of the Butlins at Bogner. A prison like was also an army camp look, and look as depressing as well. This was one of the many scary for being brightly painted. It had been tacked together with plywood and tin panels and primary colors. I had not seen flimsier buildings in England. They were so ugly. They were not pictured anywhere in the Butlins brochure, but instead shown as simplified floor plans and blue diagrams. They were called flatlets and suites. The acres of barracks were also called the accommodation area. I really liked Jonestown. The accommodations area with the barracks was divided into camps. Green, yellow, blue, and red camp. There was a central dining room and a nursery center. There was a camp chapel. There was also a miniature about where the chair lived in a monorail. All of them useful. It was a large area to cover on foot. It was just the sort of place the insane preacher must have imagined when he brought his desperate wife to Goon. Let's, let's read one more. And then we shall find a way to move this to YouTube. Oh, those of you who enjoy this sort of thing, because I know it's relaxing and it makes you feel nice. It stimulates the brain, stimulates the senses. Trippers. Rosalie and High Mutton collected reserved railways that had always been on the Romney, Heath and Downchurch, the Reving Glass, all the Welsh lines and more. They loved steam. To drive hundreds of miles and their Ford Escort to take a steam train, they were members of a steam railway preservation society. This North Norfolk railway reminded me of a line in Shepherd Mallet. And Miss Mountain said, Where's your casual top? I don't have a casual top in brown, do I? Miss Mullen said. Why are you wearing brown? Mr. Button said. I can't wear blue all the time, can I? Rhoda Gauntlet was at the window. She said, That sea looks so lovely, and the grass, its golf course, it's uh, amazing. We looked at the golf course, Sheringham, so soon. I get confused going round the golf course, Miss Martin said. You walk bloody miles, how do you know which way to go? This was the only train in Britain today, the 15-minute ride from Hayburn, Weyburn. It was sunny in Sherrington, a thousand people on the sandy beach, but only two people in the water. Because of the railway strike, all these trippers had come by car. 
They were there, old ladies walking like the promenade. They had strong country accents, probably Norfolk. I could never please these birds and halls. I should have worn my booming hat. The air's fresh. It's making my eyes water. We can look around Woolworth after we've had our tea. It was a day at the seaside, and then back to the cottages and great snoring that were not like the others, who had come to sit behind the canvas when bricks, eighty pence per day, or any portion thereof, and read four killed by runaway lawyer, wife killer given three years. She had taunted him about the money. She had not earned much. He bashed her brains out with a hammer. You've suffered enough, they just said. Or bludged and child battered and bruised with a broken leg. He fell off a chair, the mother said. One year, pending pediatrics report. They crouched on the ground, smoking cigarettes. They lay in the bright sunshine, wearing raincoats. They stood in the bathing suits. Their skin was veiny white of raw sausage casings. The town was out, so I walked to crumble along the sand. The crumbly yellow dirt cliffs were like the banks of a quarry, high and scooped out, raking vertically by corrosion. Halfway behind between the Sheringham and Cromer were people. No, because characteristically the English never strayed far from their cars or even the most crowded parts of England coast between the parking lots. Only one man was here, Collie Willie, a rock collector. He was hacking amber-colored tubes off the chalk slabs on the shore. Bellamites, he called them. Taking that one, he said, now that is between five and eight million years old. That concludes this short video. Apologize for its length not being like that of other AMS videos. Excuse me, I meant to say ASMR, not AMSR. I am not English. I read in such a way that I feel that it may stimulate the ears a bit more and give you imagination into the book and readings of this particular writer, Paul Thoreau. I hope you enjoyed what I have here. It's not much, but it's a start. If you enjoy this video, please let me know. I will not mind making more for you, more readings. I have quite a collection of books in my library. I would like to share them with you. I would like to talk to you and share all of these things with all of you. I hope you had a wonderful time listening to this book. I have more that I can share with you later. But for now, I fear that it's time to part. Please visit back soon. I'm sure I'll have something very very great for you, very, very relaxing, something, something even better.